So our final part of lecture two, this is part four, lecture two. It's all about ethics. How can we avoid being evil? <laughs> Shut up and sit down. So welcome to part four of our final part of lecture two. Uh, on planning, uh, lecture two is all about planning and designing research. So this is our final part of that second lecture. So in this video, we're looking at research ethics. We've touched on ethics in each stage of the design process. You know, it's been touched on when we looked at the design of our research questions and on involving research participants in our research. And in this video, we're going to go and dig a bit deeper into ethics. We're going to look at the ethical frameworks and guidelines that we must work to and the idea of what it means to be an ethical researcher. So ethics is a big topic. Uh, it's so big that we're going to spend some time looking at it at week six, in week six as well. So in week six, um, we're specifically looking at issues that arise when working with Indigenous Australians. So first, let's get a broad overview of ethical frameworks and guidelines. And here we're talking about Australian ethical codes that cover research involving human participants. And this applies to Australia, but most jurisdictions outside of Australia have national codes that are comparable to this one. Um, in Australia, we've got the National Health and Medical Research Council guidelines on the conduct of ethical research. And this code gives us a set of guidelines within which we must work and the guidelines are administered in universities by Human Research Ethics Committees, HRECs. So when you're doing research in a university setting, you must apply to your university's HREC in the first instance. And if your research involves an organization outside of the university, you may well have to also apply to that organization's HREC or its equivalent. Oh Christ, it's the committee that... Now this is particularly the case for government bodies in education, social services and welfare, where you may have to submit your ethics application not only to your uh, university but to those organisations as well. In some research you've got to submit your ethics application to multiple organisations. How many are there? All of those, those organisations who are represented in the research that you're doing. Now, the basic requirements of all those different ethics committees are basically the same. But each organisation may have particular requirements that are bespoke to their organisation. Now, the ethical decisions that these bodies make are deontological decisions. Deontological has a specific meaning in ethics. It comes from moral philosophy. So don't confuse this with ontology that we talked about previously. You know, um, deontological doesn't mean no theory of reality. What it means is that the morality of an action should be based on whether that action itself is right or wrong under a series of rules rather than based on the consequences of the action. The easiest translation of deontological is the ends do not justify the means. Because it's not what you do, goddammit, it's how you do it. So in that light, Research is best thought of as a living, responsive practice, as it permeates our whole project and every decision we make in our project. It's not just a response to the outcome of our research. So if your project gets ethical clearance, that doesn't mean you now no longer have to think about ethics. What do you mean it's not over? It isn't over. You have to think about ethics all the way through. Now, there are some key ethical requirements in the code and in most codes. And so we'll just go through these. So first of all, there's confidentiality. This is about protecting the anonymity and privacy of the participant. Now, there can be a lot of confusion about this. So ordinarily, when someone says something to you in confidence, that means you should not share what they've said to you with anyone else. If you ever tell anyone about that, I will kill you. So if a friend friend A tells you something in confidence, you wouldn't then go to, to friend B and tell them what friend A said. Um, but I'd, oh, I can't, I can't tell you who said it. Um, you know, you just wouldn't say it at all. So you wouldn't go to that friend and say, look, I can't tell you who said this, but someone has said blah, 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 blah. You know, confidence means confidence. Confidence means 
you know, zip it. Zip it good. You know, what, what happens in Fight Club stays in Fight, fight Club. You know, that sort of thing. You don't talk to, about, talk to anyone about it. Now, um, so in research, typically confidentiality doesn't work like that, you know, because you're going to share what participants disclose to you. You know, you, you just, you, um, you know, you're going to write a research report. You're hopefully going to publish your findings. So when you offer confidentiality, all you're really offering is anonymity. You can anonymize the identity of your participants. So in research, confidentiality typically means that you will anonymize a participant, but you will still publicly disclose the data the participant shares with you. But in Australia, we have another complication, which is that confidentiality means something different for Indigenous people, like Aboriginal people. We're going to talk about that in week six, so we won't look at it just now. Next on the list, we have informed consent. And here we need to ensure people have enough information so as to make an informed decision as to whether they want to be involved in your research. The key information we must provide uh, potential participants is about their rights to confidentiality. Can you hear the birds outside? I was distracted by them. Can you hear them? I don't know if you can hear them. If you can't, me mentioning them is even more distracting than perhaps the sound of the birds in the first place. So anyway, crack on, stop getting distracted, Paul. So confidentiality. Um, so, so, sorry, when you're giving informed consent, you've got to um, be very clear about what is involved in the research. What exactly do you want me to do? So you must provide potential participants with all the information about their rights to confidentiality, again, being very careful to explain precisely what this means, and giving detail on how their identity will be protected. You've got to give them sufficient detail on what their involvement in the project means, you know, time commitment and so on. You've got to tell them how the data will be collected, how long it will typically take, um, you know, if you're running an interview, how long will that interview take, um, as well as telling them what you'll do with the data, how you analyze it, and what will happen with your analysis. You know, what will you use the data for? We will process the data through the central computer. So participant needs to, participants need to know all of this so they can decide if they want to be involved in your project. And participants also need to be given the right to withdraw. Now, there's a common mistake here um, made even by experienced researchers. I know this because for several years I served on a university research ethics committee. The mistake here is to tell participants that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time. Uh, we can't offer this. The reason uh, we can't offer this is that once we've published our research findings, you know, it's obviously too late for the participant to withdraw their data. I thought that meant I could leave whenever I wanted. But it might not be even possible for a participant to withdraw when we're in the final stages of our data analysis or even in the middle of our analysis if the effect of the participant withdrawing their data means that we have to start our analysis all over again. You know, we just might not have time to do that or even the funding to do it. And we can't pull the plug on the whole research project because one participant or even two participants want to withdraw their data. So what we should do is we should say to a participant that they have the right to withdraw up to a certain point in the project. Usually we'll give them a, a time. So we might say that they can withdraw up to a certain date and say that after that date, the data will either have been published or in the final stages of analysis, which would make withdrawal impossible. Turn back at once before it's too late. Now, the next ethical issue is in relation to the skills we have as a researcher. And we need to convince the ethics committee in our ethics proposal that the people involved in the research are sufficiently trained and skilled to carry out the research. Are we going to have any good skills? What do you mean? And now this, again, links back to the issues we talked about in relation to why it's not a good idea to undertake ethically sensitive projects as part of an honours programme or part of honours research. The ethical issue becomes heightened when the researcher is inexperienced. You know, if we're doing a very a socially and ethically very sensitive piece of research and it's an honours project, the researcher is inexperienced because they're doing the project as part of their research training, then, oh, oh boy, you're in all sorts of trouble. You know, um, because we have to consider, and this is another part of the ethical decisions, uh, ethical process, um, we have to make take consideration 
of the benefits and we have to make sure that the benefits of project of a project outweigh the risks now when the primary benefit of a project for an honors um, piece of research is that the uh, research is going to benefit they're going to get a degree they're going to graduate well that's not a great benefit is it you know it, you're not going to say that that is going to be such a great benefit for people participating in the project that it's okay to put them at risk so you get the idea there, I think. So that's an important balancing thing we've got to consider for all ethical projects. You know, we've got to consider the benefits against the risks. When the risks of a project increases, then we have to make sure the benefits increase even more. Does the risk of a detour outweigh the benefits of an extra payload? So in socially sensitive research, there has to be a lot of benefit to the people who are in the project or benefit to society at large for doing the research if you're going to take on or ask participants to take on those ethical risks. Now the next issue is data storage. This, the data that you collect must be secure and data must be destroyed after a certain period of time. It must be destroyed. No, no we can't. With the data increasingly being digitized these days, it usually involves, this data storage idea usually involves some form of encryption. In the old days, we just had to say that data would be stored in a locked filing cabinet or in a locked office. But now we need to ensure the data is encrypted and only stored on computers that are secure, such as ones that have two-factor authentication. What the hell am I saying? What's wrong with your ducket? Two-factor authentication. There, got there in the end. Two-factor authentication. You know, like a password and a fingerprint um, or a key card. Now, we're just catching up to this um, in relation to the new requirements under the digital storage of data and things are shifting. Um, only a few years ago, there wasn't a requirement to have two-factor authentication. Nailed it. But now, increasingly, there is. And, um, yeah, new protocols are emerging, um, you know, almost daily in relation to good practice in terms of encrypting your data. Also, there are specific protocols on how you delete files from your hard drive. You know, you don't just hit the delete button and then think that it disappears from your hard drive. Actually, for um, spinning hard drives, the data is still still there. I think for SSDs as well. Sorry, it's getting a bit technical. Anyway, it's not enough just to hit the delete key. You have to often go through a more elaborate process to get that data cleaned from your hard drive. Now, finally, we need to ensure that our participants have access to our research findings and that an accessible version of our findings is provided to them upon request. So it's insufficient to send participants a copy of an academic journal paper, particularly if that journal paper is written in really dense academic language that's hard to understand. Have you noticed that? Some of the journals that you read? Um, gobbledygook. No one can understand them. Some people, some of us just pretend to understand them. You know, if you're going to, you want to make your findings available, but there has to be available in plain English so people can understand them. You don't need a PhD in the subject matter to be able to read them. Oh, sorry, my things are buzzing. Okay. So let's, let's move on. Now, those considerations apply to all research, but there are particular ethical issues for qualitative research. First, researchers are often working outside of university settings, for example, um, outside of a laboratory ses setting. So we can be out in public settings. When we're doing qualitative research, we can often be out in public settings, but also we could be holding interviews in people's homes. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, we often um, interview people in their own homes because that's the most convenient thing for people. And we have to ensure that this doesn't place us as researchers or our participants at risk, particularly in regards to traveling, for us traveling to and from a person's home, but also people knowing where we are and also avoiding being alone with a stranger without having some safeguards in place. Are you all alone? You know? That having a protocol, what to do if you're feeling at risk. There are also particular psychological risks uh, when we're interviewing people about issues that can give rise to strong and unpleasant emotions. 
The other thing that's worth just mentioning here is the gender issue. Like you don't really want to have a situation where a woman is going around to a man's home and she'll be alone with this man, she doesn't know them. There are particular things we need to think about there in terms of safety of the researcher. So uh, yeah, there's um, often a lot to it, a lot more to ethical issues and qualitative research because we're out of the laboratory. We're in settings that um, we have to think about um, doing risk analysis for, you know? Okay, now, also for qualitative research, informed consent is, um, is more of an iterative process. In terms of informed consent, it needs to be a continual process. And we'll talk about this at our residential school, but basically this is about making sure that we're aware that consent can be withdrawn during an interview, and we need to anticipate when a person might be feeling uncomfortable and might when we might need to offer them the chance to withdraw from the study, you know, to stop the interview. It's particularly important when we're talking about topics that are sensitive and which neither the interviewer or interviewee anticipated would be discussed. Do you want to talk about it? Not really. So you might get onto some really private personal issues um, during the interview and you need to make sure that you've still got the consent of the participant to be talking and often you just got to observe to make sure to see, pick up signs of uncomfortableness but you can also verbally check saying are you happy to carry on with our interview you know we're obviously talking about some difficult things blah 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 you know so you're asking for consent um, during the interview don't just think you've got consent because you asked for it right at the start of the interview the confidentiality is also harder to ensure with qualitative research. You know, we audio or video record our participants. And so they can be directly identified um, from our data. But also when people are describing their lived experiences, it might be easy to identify the person from the description of their lived experience. Watson, I found some important new clues. For example, if you have a quote from an interview that reads, I had a particularly hard time studying psychology at CQ University because I was the only male student in the class during 2019. Now, if that was a quote in your interview, it'd be, it would be relatively easy to identify who that participant was. You know, you just look to see um, who was the only male in the class of 2019 studying psychology at CQ University, and then you've identified them. Yeah, so it's, so it's possible to do it if you've got a will to do it. So we often have to change identifying information. So in that instance, we'd change the name of the university. You know, we'd make up an, a university name. So we'd use a pseudonym for the organization. I uh, would also probably not refer to anyone that the participant referred to, changing people's names, changing enough of the description that people give us to ensure that the person can't be identified. We need a disguise. And moreover, we often have to take additional measures to secure our audio and our video recordings. You know, we don't load them up on YouTube. <laughs> you know, it's for everyone to see. And we have to make sure that those recordings are, are secure because people are so readily identifiable through those recordings. Then we have to be careful um, in qualitative work when we critically engage with what participants tell us. We may find that in our analysis we point out how participants might be thinking in a problematic way or that a participant's beliefs are based on misinformation. This can be quite hurtful if a participant finds out that their views have been challenged in this way. You know, they might have trusted you as a researcher and then you write up your research and you're basically telling, <laughs> telling everyone who's reading your article that this participant was talking bull BS. It's nearly swore. <laughs> BS is the same as swearing, isn't it? Just not explicitly. You have to say it in your head rather than my head. Anyway. So yeah, it's not nice. <coughs> Particularly if you're, you know, you might be interviewing someone you know, and then you go around and in your publication, you say that that person you know was talking rubbish. That's a better word, isn't it? Rubbish. <coughs> Shit. Oh no. Can I bleep that out? Self-control, Paul. Stop diverting from the script. Right, stay focused. We're nearly through this. So, finally, we sometimes have to manage dual relationships. And often when we're working in a real-world setting, and sometimes, you know, when we're in a real-world settings, we sometimes have relationships with the people in those settings that, we, uh, that aren't just our relationship with them as research participants. 
<laughs> so we might we might research something in our local community. And here we're not just a researcher, but also a member of the community. And we need to be careful that this dual relationship doesn't create any conflicts of interest and that we we properly think through the nature of that dual relationship. So if, say, for example, if you're doing a research project that's evaluating your own teaching practices, that can be seen as a conflict of interest because not only are you a researcher, but you're also the tutor to the students. So if you're asking, doing a survey, looking at, you know, whether tu the students think that a, a tutor's teaching practices are good or bad, <coughs> if you're the tutor and the researcher, conflict of interest. You know, you might be undertaking the evaluation and finding a way of doing your analysis to put yourself in a good light so you get promotion. Whatever way you cut it, you're going to personally be advantaged potentially personally be advantaged or disadvantaged by the findings of that research. So you've got a conflict of interest in that research. Now our research must also be non-discriminatory because we're engaged in such a deep level of sense making, we need to keep our personal biases and assumptions in check. Now if we don't keep this stuff in check, our research can contribute to people's further marginalization. So we need to check that our use of language um, doesn't unintentionally discriminate against people. So, for example, if we talk about couples when actually what we mean are heterosexual couples, but we don't say heterosexual couples, we just say couples, but we're thinking about heterosexual couples. So all those ways that language can end up being discriminatory or unfair to certain groups. And also we shouldn't be making assumptions in our demographic data. So if all your participants are men, it's important to flag that. If all your participants are white, it's important to flag that. You have to mention these things and not mentioning them can hide the impact that gender um, and ethnicity can have on your research findings. Also, you need to try to avoid situations where all of your participants are white men, unless that's a group that you're purposefully looking at. You know, we talked about this a bit in part three of this lecture series. Now, in assessment three, there's a question on ethics. And that particular question will be covered in more depth during week six, but we have, so we have covered um, material in this video that will give you a good grounding to be able to answer that question. So have a look at this slide again in your own time and um, you know download it from Moodle uh, and keep the this slide in mind um, as we build up towards assessment three. So that's it for lecture two and this was our final part of that lecture sequence. So this takes us up to Teaching Week 4, and we've got our tutorial in Teaching Week 4, so I'm looking forward to seeing you online. By the way, there's a lot of howling around here. It's not my, not, it's not a student has snuck into the studio and is howling in despair at the content of today's lecture. No, it's not that. Surprise, surprise. It's the wind. It's very windy outside. There you go. You thought you'd get through a whole whole video presentation with, without me complaining about the weather. That's not going to happen. Anyway, so till later, till next time, or till the tutorial, ta-da.